Now, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Acts chapter 12. When Jared began reading from there, it made me a little nervous, uh, but the Lord knows all about that, and this was not the sermon I had planned for the day, but the Lord would not let me get away from it, so this is what we're going to preach. Acts chapter 12, beginning in the very first verse. The Bible says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vet certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was walk, uh, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. God, we thank you for its guidance. We thank you for its reality. We thank you uh, that it guides our life and uh, gives us a glimpse of you. God, we pray this morning that you would bless your word to the hearts of the believers that are here. Lord, that you would convict the lost here and that you would stir them up and uh, make them living again so they might cry out for salvation. God, we pray today that uh, you would bless uh, according to your mercy and grace. Amen. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, Luke recording the ministries really of Peter and of uh, Paul and the early church, its existence, and how things developed and went. And uh, we come to a portion, and if you know the orders of Acts, the what had just happened, the Lord had saved a bunch of Gentiles. And they had been, and Peter says, Well, I can't see why they can't be baptized. And the Lord did a great work. Now, whenever the Lord does a great work, the devil is going to be on the scene. Yeah. Now, uh, that's his character, that's his nature. And everybody says, Well, he knows he's going to de be defeated. Well, I don't know that he does or not because he's not all knowing, he is not omnipotent as unto God is. And so he may know it, he may not, I don't know. But I do know this, he's not going to give up trying. And so uh, in response to this uh, magnificent uh, thing that happened with the Gentiles, the devil shows up on the scene and begins to do some things that would hinder the early church. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now I want you to see that when, uh, the, and I believe the devil used Herod, uh, I believe he was operating, uh, probably he hated the church, but he was uh, no doubt operating under the direction of sin, and any time that happens, uh, watch out. Now, he said he was going to vex. Now, that is actually a term that means illness, it means bring down, it means to stop, and that was his idea, was to make the church in a situation where it could not go forward. Now, uh, should the Lord not return in my lifetime, the church in New Testament needs to go forward. The church in Paris needs to go forward. See, uh, the, the devil doesn't understand that the church is an eternal thing just as much as God. Uh, he, uh, he told Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, will each church last? No. But there'll be a church somewhere. <laughs> and, and, and so we find then that uh, the devil's ignorance of this truth uh, caused this vexation of the Lord's people. Verse 2, and he meaning Herod, and he killed James, the brother of John, uh, with the sword. And that was one of the first, uh, the first four called. And because he saw it pleased the Jews. Now we have the Gentiles or, or Herod, the Roman government that's over the land of Israel at this time, hating the Lord's church. And we have the Jews, the religious elite of the day, hating the church. And you know what? We've about come full circle with that again. Our government hates people 
like us. And it's becoming more and more apparent. We're the bigots. Uh, we're the short-minded people. And, and the more you stand for the Word of God, the more you're going to see that. Now, also out there, there's group that's loosely called churches that equally hate us as well. They, and so we see that the time of Herod has come again. We have seen, we see that it's very much like that in the day which we live. And as Brother Jared alluded to, uh, you know, it might be in, in our lifetimes that we see executions beginning because of what they propagate to be hate speech. And, and so we see that's the environment and the time that, uh, that they were living. Verse 3, and, he be, and because he, meaning Herod, saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, I don't know if this was a year after the Lord's crucifixion or resurrection or two years. I've heard, I've heard thoughts on both sides. I, I mean, it's really immaterial when it comes down to it. But I want you to see that... Um, the Jews, once again, just like in the days of Christ, didn't want to happen during the Passover. And uh, because they were religious, religious, they were self-righteous. Now, they wanted him dead, but they just didn't want him dead in the day of their religion. You know, uh, that's kind of, uh, again, come full circle. Uh, everybody's religious, but uh, nobody believes the Word of God. And, and so we find that uh, he stopped or postponed in honor of the Jews. Now, this did not happen by accident. It was the Almighty. Anytime a life is preserved or taken, you can write it down. It's under the act of the Almighty God. And what we need to do is accept it, if we can, and, and say that's the movement of God and just take it for what it is. Uh, verse 4, and when he had apprehended him, meaning when Herod apprehended Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quanturians of soldiers. Now, if you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ died, as he lay in his grave, uh, remember they said, remember the deceiver said that in three days he would rise. And he sent 16 soldiers over there to guard the, the, uh, the uh, grave of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he rose anyway. Now, no doubt, this prompt preempted this same plan. Uh, you know, he, well, I've seen him get away once. He's not going to get away this time. Now, even, and it's told today among the Jewish culture that uh, the, the disciples stole the Lord Jesus' body yeah. and hid it somewhere else. Uh, I know people who believe that. And, and, and so we find, uh, we find that to avoid that a second time, he had this plan to keep them blocked. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in the prison and delivered him to four quanturians of soldier to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, if you remember, the Roman government was one of those governments that wanted to make everybody happy and nobody mad. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something that might be happening even in the day which we live today? And so the, this Greek festival called Easter began to be mixed and mingled with, uh, uh, with the uh, Passover so that it appeased everybody. And today it is mixed and mingled with supposed Christian Easter, which is nothing but a feast of fertility. We shouldn't have anything to do with it. It has nothing to do with the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. All it is is about uh, having... Uh, multiple babies. And so we find what we ought to do is leave that alone. And we find here that it was appeasement. We live in a day of appeasement. As long as you go with the flow, listen, you're going to be okay. But the minute you say, no, that ain't right, and I ain't going to do it, you're going to have problems. You're going to have difficulty. And, and, and so we find that it was the same way then and a repetition of the day which we live in today. Verse 5, And Peter therefore was kept in prison. 
Now, I want you to see that we are not exempt of that in the modern day. Uh, it's going to get worse, and, and those times are probably coming again. I probably will live to see them. You two and Jared, you will live to see them. I will guarantee you that it will happen. And, and so that time is being repetitious as well. Now, I want you to see if we got into prison, we about ready to be throwing the towel, would we not? Yeah. You know, everyone in this room, except you, you four, know someone that's been in prison because he would not bow down. And that is Wayne Adams. He went awry. Uh, very sorry about Wayne. I don't hate him. I thought, I'm sorry, you know, because, you know, tomorrow it could be me. And, uh, but, down in Louisville, which is about three hours north of here, they made an edict and said, you must have a license to preach. And it sounded so good you wanted a group hug because all that money was going to go to help the homeless. But see, I don't need a license to preach. I need a license to practice nursing, but I don't need a license to preach nor will I take one, because this is what licenses do. Then they began to control what you say and what you do. Uh, for example, I can't intubate anybody because I don't have a certification yet. See, my license controls what I can and cannot do. You see what I'm saying? In the same way, your license as a preacher will do the exact same thing. And, and, and so if you remember, Wayne said, no, I ain't going to do it. And he was arrested and spent eight weeks in the Louisville prison. You don't think it can happen again? That was like 20 years ago, at least. And here we are today. So very early, we need to make a determination what we're going to do. So we'll be prepared. But so uh, God might give us some strength in the day that comes. And so we find that uh, for religious appeasement that uh, Herod was going to put it off for a few days. Verse 9, and Herod would have brought him, uh, and when Herod would have brought him forth the same night. Now executions and that day we're done at night. And, and uh, by the way, you know where execution, when executions are administered in Tennessee? At midnight, 1201. So that, that's, not a, that's not a new thing. And so at the time that they were, that very night, God moved in. When do you want God to move in? Right? It may not happen. It may be to the point where you're about ready to give up. It may be to the point where you throw it in the towel. And you say, why would God do that? To give him glory and honor and raise up his name. I came this close to death and God began to move. That's why it's for some glory and honor. There's not one thing that he does. And you remember he says this, for this reason I rose up Pharaoh. You think that rebellious, ungodly uh, man did all, his, uh, did all that ungodliness on his own? Study the life of Pharaoh. Sometimes it said God hardened his heart. And sometimes it says he hardened his heart. You know, that, I, I've always read that very carefully because... Isn't it, isn't it scary that you can harden your own heart? That, that, that's a very scary thought, is it not? And, and so we find that uh, it was down to the wire, so to speak. It was time for this uh, execution to be carried out. And we find midway of verse 6, Peter was sleeping. Now, I always found that to be very interesting, and, and there's one or two things that was going on. Peter had so much the peace of God that he was sleeping, or he had given up and thought that it didn't matter anyway. Now, if you remember in Acts chapter 3, 
I believe Peter had gotten behind being one that denied the name of Christ. I believe he'd gotten past being the one that, and, and was now the one to even present the gospel to the Gentiles, and he had moved forward in his ministry. So I believe we just had the peace of God. That's my own opinion. I don't have scripture and verse for that. That's just my opinion. So with that, I ask you, do you have that level of peace? You know what, church? Death is coming. It's a very much reality. You may go peacefully in your sleep, or you may get hit by a truck, or you may writhe in cancer for over a year. I don't know. But I can assure you this, death is coming. Yeah, right. Are you going to have the peace that Peter did? Are, are you going to have the solitude that Peter enjoyed knowing the very next morning that his head was going to, his neck was going to be on the block, he was going to lose his head, and he went to sleep out of the goodness of God. That is where I want to be. That is where I want to live. And listen, you don't live in that spot by simply reading the Word of God. You don't live in that spot uh, by being a five-pointer. You don't live in that spot by going to a sound church. You live in that spot by effectual prayer. Time and time again. You know what? I want my, my relationship to the Lord Jesus to be like this. That's how I want this to intertwine with myself. You know, I can't think of his name now. Yeah, they're starting that church back up over in Central City. And the old man that pastored there for years, we was preaching a meeting together at White Plains Baptist Church. He died during the night during that meeting. And uh, uh, he, the, his wife told me this, his widow told me this, because I went to the funeral, that in the weeks before he died, he'd be th walking through the house talking, and he thought, she thought he was saying something to her, and I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to the Lord. That, that's an intertwined relationship, isn't it? That's the kind of stuff I want to have. That, that's the relationship I want with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe Peter was so peaceful with whatever fell, uh, whatever went down that he was he was good with it because God was good with it, and he went to sleep on the night before his execution, bound with two chains, and I'm assuming that means one on each side or maybe on his legs. I, I don't know where the chains were located. The Bible doesn't say; it just says there's two. And the keeper before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smokes Peter on the side. Now, you get a picture of this this morning, and, and, the, cha and the Bible says that the chains fell off, and uh, I know me and Eric know, and Donna probably knows, Junior used to have this huge, heavy chain down in the shop. I guess it's still there. The links were that big in their iron. And you would try to pick it up, and it's all you could do to get the chain off the ground. And you know, if you dropped it, it made a horrible sound. You know what? You'll hear nothing unless God opens your ears. He that had an ear, let him hear. You, you ever wonder why the guards didn't wake up? Their ears were muted. <coughs> Just like a spiritual ear, you only hear what God wants you to hear. You only hear what is uh, what is uh, <laughs> permissible unto God. And so we find uh, that this event and the light shone and it was bright. Why didn't the light wake them up? Now, I'm a very light sleeper and uh, if Donna comes in and turns the light on, you know what? It's going to wake me up. That flash of light. Why did the guards not wake up? The Bible says because you're blinded. You don't see it because you don't want you to see it. Now, that's always talking about the gospel, is it not? But I believe it's applicable to everything, don't you? you? How many times did you hear the gospel before you heard it? You know what I mean? I, I can't even count how many times. 
I, I'm honest. I don't even remember the first time I heard the gospel. Right. I, I truly don't. I, I, I mean, I'm supposing I was like these two. And, uh, and, and so we find in the very same way, uh, God hid their eyes from the situation at hand. He hid their eyes from the deliverance. And Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the keeper of the prison and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, Arise up quickly and his chains fell off. Now, I also want you to get <laughs> this is that he had to be woke up. You know, every once in a while, we as the Lord's people, we just need to be woke up. We get so mundane, we get so routine, we hear preaching on the Lord's church, and we hear the five points to nausea, and we don't hear about the goodness of God. Man. We need to be woke up. You know what's wrong with the Lord's churches that need to be woke up? Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I think much of the great awakening was a sham. But... There was some sincerity in there too. Let me ask you this. Just to hear the word of God. How anxious are you to sleep six or seven in a covered wagon, not big as these two pews, just simply to hear the word, word of God preach? That was the great awakening. Listen, you don't get that kind of dedication uh, out of some charlatans. Right? That, that was the great awakening. And Peter said, the Lord came, uh, the angel came and said, get up. We're going out of here. We're leaving. <laughs> Wasn't it a wonderful thing when the Lord said you, that to you? You know, when it's looking bleak, the Lord's going to show up. When it's looking difficult, when it looks like there's nowhere else to go, the Lord's going to show up. He, he's going to do something miraculous and great that only can be attributed to the Almighty. And that's what he that's what he did here. Verse 8. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. You know what? Another thing with deliverance and, and faithful prayer. Be obedient. Be obedient. That's the hardest thing you'll ever do. When it seems it passes all reason. Be obedient. So, you know what? He put his shoes on and he was ready to go. You ever think about this? And of course, this was the week of the Passover. I'll remind you of that. You know how they were on the Passover? They were dressed and ready to go. Year after year after year. Just like in the deliverance from Egypt, they had their, they had their moving clothes on. Do you have your moving clothes on? Nah. I, I don't most days. But sometimes, uh, uh, that's one thing about working car trip. You face the sun going and you face it coming home. It just bonds you both ways. But, I look at that big sunrise from there and think, this could be the day. Mm -hmm. the, the, this, this could be when he says, come up here. Amen. He could be done with it. He could be, it could be over. And, and, and what a joy and the gloriousness that would be to know that we would be home evermore with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and nothing that would concern us or nothing that we would have left to do but to praise Him throughout eternity without the confines and the tiredness and the sickness of this flesh. Just praise Him and praise Him and praise Him. And, and that's what we ought to be mindful to do. And so Peter was obedient and he got his shoes on. And he saith unto them, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And what's not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. Now, I want you to see this was in the apostolic day and visions were still very much a reality of, of the messaging of God to his own Christ people. And, uh, but, they, but listen, they didn't have 66 books to go by. And, and so we see that the Lord did that time and time again. In fact, 
uh, he saw he saw the man over there and said, "Come over here and help us." And he went. That that had just happened a little bit before this. And he thought, maybe I'm seeing a vision about deliverance instead of experience deliver, experiencing deliverance. See, praise be His name, I've experienced deliverance, and and not just once. I mean, I've been, I've been saved multiple times. But he put me in some hopeless situations and brought me out time and time again. When there was no money, all of a sudden there was enough money. When there seemed that my health would finally cave in out of nothing, out of, out of the goodness of God, I'm right. not where I need to be. Amen. See, that's the kind of faith we need to you know that's faith, right. is it not? We, we need something far more than just showing up for the services and showing up and singing. That's all good. But what we really need is a prayerful life built on faith. You know, it's one thing to say a prayer, and it's quite another thing to have faith that it's going to be. Uh, that, that's two things, and they're almost contrary, the one to the other. Verse 10. When they were past the first and second ward, which kind of like a hospital ward, they're going through uh, sections of the prison. And again, they're going unobserved, unheard, undetected. And, and, and we don't believe God can heal a runny nose. <laughs> what a wonderful God we serve. This is a reality. This is not just fan. This is not just fantasy. This this is a historical record. That's why Luke wrote it, so that we would know the first years of church by detail. And, and so we see that Peter just kept walking, just kept moving, just kept following the angel. And notice what happens. And they came to the iron gate, which leadeth into the city which opened of them to its own accord. And there are usually huge locks there. And they, meaning Peter and the angel, went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he says, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and delivered me of the hand of Herod. You know, what a wonderful... You know, we all have doubts. If you don't have doubts, you're lying to me this morning. Right? Isn't it a wonderful, marvelous thing when you know of a surety? When you get back past the situation and you look back and say, well, the Lord did all that. Yeah. Because I wasn't capable. I, I had nothing to do it with. And he did it for me. You know, a lot of people get down about turning 40. I did. <laughs> I rejoiced to turn 40. Because uh, I had about half of my hippocampus removed when I was 39. So 40 looked pretty good. Mm -hmm. Now 50 body. <laughs> uh, but the Lord's been good, ain't he? See, uh, you know when you'll learn that? When you begin to realize the inability of man. When you, when you come to the in inability of man, there's no other answer that it has to be God, right? And, and, and so we see that uh, Peter finally figured out, I've been delivered by the Almighty. I've been delivered. Uh, God used his angel and he's delivered me out of this place. And, and have delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered this thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. We were talking about all the Mary boys. I forgot this one last night. And they were, and they were gathered together praying. 
Now, you think about that, and the Bible tells us at least twice to be in constant prayer. You know what? For this, oh boy, it's an impossibility. I mean, you've got to sleep sometime, right? But I can be in the spirit of prayer. See, the reason our prayers are not factual and, and, and we're not always ready to pray is because of the sin we allow in our lives. And then, then sin has to be dealt with before you can even cry out to the Almighty about your need or about your situation or, or about uh, even about praise. And so we find then that, uh, how's your prayer life? See, you're not going to get an effectual prayer as a corporate church by just sitting around. Mm -hmm. By, by just going through a routine. What, what gives you effectual prayer is staying focused on the things of God and staying focused on your prayer life. Very few of us have an effective prayer life most of the time. Verse, uh, uh, verse 11, And when Peter was come to himself, uh, excuse me, I read that, uh, and when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. And many were gathered together, gathered together, praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. Thou, thou art crazy. Thou, thou has no sense. That's what that means. It, it isn't a marvel to you that they got what they prayed for and at least at first didn't give credit to God. Right. In other words, they thought it was impossible. They prayed for it, yeah. but they never believed it would happen. Right. You know what? I've been guilty of that, haven't you? You know what that's called, dear friend? It's going through the motions. That's it. That's it. Uh, a a faith-filled prayer believes from the beginning that God will, will come to the resolution. Now, we're not going to always get what we want, but there'll be some kind of resolution to that issue. And it's good and right, and it's bought by the sovereign God of heaven. So why would we possibly possibly question his, his his movement in the matter although I've seen the Lord's people do that many many times and when she, uh, verse 15 and they said unto her thou art mad but she constantly affirmed that it was even so then said they it's his angel or his ghost or his spirit but angel uh, but Peter continued knocking and when they had opened the door they saw him and were astonished. Now, I want you to see that's a wonderful blessing when we see God work and He answers and in, uh, intervenes uh, in a, a marvelous way. I do stand astonished. I, I, I'm with the group, you know, not only am I surprised, but I'm amazed at God's goodness and His power over all things that He can put under His feet and do what He willeth all the time. That's amazing to me. Mm. Now, uh, uh, this uh, this morning, the girls may have heard it. I don't know. Don's running around like a rat of decon. Uh, but uh, I, I, uh, I was listening to the song I heard back in the 80s. Uh, it was uh, Somebody Touched the Lord. It's about prayer. And many years ago, and I think I was there, I may have just watched some video, I can't remember. The group that did that uh, had the author come forward. They, they didn't write it. They were given it by the author. And a little girl about that one size came up with her mother, and she had written the song. And she had been given the news, and they did, for what was in the 80s, the highest level of ultrasound you could get. And they told her the, the baby... Uh, had multiple congenital abnormalities that it was uh, 
had a heart condition, had a mental condition, or uh, uh, a delay up here. Uh, it had problems with its lungs, and they uh, recommended a therapeutic abortion. And, and, being, and being a Christian, she said, well, I certainly can't do that. But she was down and out and discouraged, and, and she got to the point where she couldn't even pray for the little girl that she was carrying within her. And she began to call on all her friends and said, I'm in bad shape, I can't pray. Pray for my baby. Well, it went on. She delivered that baby, and it was just as healthy as a horse. And a little youngin was on the stage, just as healthy as this one, walking along. Somebody touched the Lord. That's right. Was the ultrasound wrong? Mm -mm. I think the ultrasound was right on point, but God intervened. They didn't miss nothing. They saw it for what it was. But somebody touched the Lord. See, we need to remember that, do we not? Uh, That's effectual prayer. When it looks hopeless, you take it before the Lord. When there's no options left, you take it before the Lord. You lay it all about Him and, I, uh, and, and, and put it before Him and He will bless mightily in, in the most unusual ways. And so we see that even the other believers were amazed at what uh, God had done. Verse 17. But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, Go shew these things unto James and to, and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Declare it. Uh, you know why you go through rough situations? So you can declare it. You know uh, why you get financial issues and there's no way out? Because you can declare it. Uh, nothing is hopeless with God on our side. No. Um, how's your prayer life this morning? The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Right. What's the part of that that we don't claim? The righteous man. Right? You know why our prayer life is so muddled most of the time? Is there so much sin in our lives? And listen, we live in a day and age where not only is it tolerate, tolerated, it's celebrated. Uh, the stuff we see today is atrocious will be normal in one generation. You know, the Bible says this, and there rose up in, uh, a generation that knew not God. Right. Mm -hmm. We're there. Yeah. We're there. What we're going to do? Pray about it. Could you imagine the corrupt generation that we live in? And boys, all four of you, that's your generation. I don't mean about that, but it is. Uh, that there was a great revival. Men that are still debauched, that they run above other men, saved the glory and the honor of God. Mm -hmm. Women that. Uh, uh, that have killed their own babies, expressing repentance for that. Is that outside the ability of our God? No. I want that, don't you? I crave that. One time in my life, I would love to see a revival not wrought by man and man's wisdom, but simply wrought by God. You know, I always think uh, about Brother Noah Broughton. You remember he preached that unbelievable revival at Bumpus Mills. And Adam was saved, and that old uh, FBI agent was saved, don't remember. And uh, there was one other. I was trying to think the other day who that was. Uh, but it never came to me. Uh, I want, that gave me enough taste for it. I wanted more. 
about that to you. I, uh, I really desire that more than anything else, but I've come to this conclusion. It's not going to happen with us being mediocre. It, it's not going to happen going through a routine. The only way that that's going to happen is God's people to get back to prayer. Pray in specifics. I pray for my grandchildren. I pray for my lost children. And I pray that I might receive a reviving of God's people. That's the redeemed already. We need to see a revival among that group too, just as much as we need to see the lost saved. So how's your prayer life? If, if prayers walk, walk to be made, which is what the scripture just told us, how's your prayer life? That's the big question, is it not? 